Father God, we thank you so much for this morning that you have given us, and we thank you that we are able to gather together, Lord, to worship your holy name, the name that is worthy of worship, the only name that is worthy of worship, God, the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Holy God Almighty, present is to come. God of glory, you're so worthy, all the saints bow down. Sing that again, holy, holy.
Father, we couldn't lift our voices high enough to sing that praise. We desire for your praises to be on our lips for our entire life. You are the only one who can bring beauty from ashes. And that's exactly what you've done in each of our lives. And we praise you for it this morning. We love you. We pray that you would fall upon us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, why don't you guys take a minute to turn around and say hey. All right. I can get rid of the sport coat, and we can get into the Word of God. <laughs> now, it's a, it's a blessing. <coughs> um, so many times when people leave uh, in, in churches in America, they just kind of leave for bad reasons or slip out the back door. But we've had so many good departures. And <coughs> um, if you're going to move on, it's always good that God has called you on. Amen? Yes. And that's what I think is taking place here. So turn with me to John chapter 1. But uh, I have not forgotten we need to pray for revival, and we will. But John chapter 1. Just have your place there. I don't know if the battery is down on this one, but I've tried to click forward with no success. So uh, there, now it did, but if you guys can advance me there and then check that out. But um, I've been thinking about this thought a lot, and we'll pray for revival in just a second. Uh, it's found in Jeremiah 33. Praise the Lord of hosts, for the Lord is good. His mercy endures forever. I've been thinking a lot lately about the mercy of God. Aren't you glad God has mercy on us and our nation? Did y'all know there's a presidential election coming? Did y'all know, <laughs> did anyone heard about that? You know, uh, you know we've, got, we've got so many things. I, I look around and, um, you know, just God's been so merciful to us. Uh, the vast majority of our leaders just reflect us. That they're full of pride because America's full of pride. Um, you know, I, I pray for our president, but he's a very prideful man. But so is the other side, very smug and prideful, and you just kind of see just this, um, we don't need anyone, we're super smart, we have all the answers, and we don't have any answers. Part of our repentance is to say, God, we don't know anything apart from your word. Amen? And by the way, uh, with the presidential election coming up, you know, I, I'm, I'm not attached to parties at all. I will be voting unequivocally with life. And the saving of it, that, that we don't have little babies like these aborted before birth. I will be voting unequivocally, but not because we have awesome options. <laughs> we don't. But I'm still going to vote as close to the Bible as I possibly can. God's plan for marriage, not this world's plan. God's plan for the family. God's plan for the, you know, what the Word of God says. So uh, you, you really should say, Lord... No matter what, thank you for the freedoms I'm given, but make sure I use them 
to honor and glorify you to the things that matter most to God. And uh, so keep that in mind as you uh, step into the uh, voting booth. And, but again, no matter what happens in elections, we still need a revival. Amen? We still need people to come to Christ. We still need pastors to preach the word. We still need people to turn to Christ because that is our hope. It's not in our leaders. It's not in Congress. It's not in the Supreme Court. All of those things. And we, we've been doing this for, I'm 51. I've been through many elections now and, and we, we need revival as much now as when I was a senior in high school in 1987. It just, just continues to get a little worse and a little bit worse as far as people pulling further and further away from God and more and more just we don't need the Lord and so uh, that's the way, why we've been praying for over a decade now. And I believe God is going to answer our prayers, but it might get tougher, but we might see more people coming to the Lord. It might get more chaos, but we might see more people come to the Lord. And so we need to have the Holy Spirit give us the purity we need, but also the strength we need to live in these times. So we've been doing this every week. Uh, if you can, take about 45 seconds. If you're able to get on your knees, go for it. If you can't get on your knees and you have knee problems or sit right where you're at, take about 45 seconds in silence, pray to the Lord, say, Lord, revive me, revive our community and revive this church and revive Austin, Texas, where uh, the Clarks are headed and every other place in this country, and then I'll close this in prayer and we'll jump into John. Let's pray. Father, you are good, and your mercy endures forever. Thank you for sending Jesus. As we get into the book of John, Lord, we thank you that you sent the Word made flesh. But Lord, you came to call us out of darkness. And Lord, each and every one of us, Lord, we ask that you would refresh our walk with you. Because of your mercy and your grace, Lord, cleanses of our own sins and iniquities, our own pride, our own arrogance, our own covetousness, and our, our own idolatry, our own materialism, whatever it may be, Lord, our own lust, whatever we came into this room, Lord, you know each heart, Lord, whatever it is, Lord, our own fears, our own, uh, Lord, just desires and ambitions, Lord, anything that is not of you, we ask that you would cleanse my brothers and sisters, myself, Lord, all of us, you'd wash us by the blood of Jesus because your mercy endures forever. And your grace really is amazing, Lord. And we thank you that you've saved many of us in this room, but I pray if there's anyone in this room or watching online that is not yet born again, Lord, just like these babies have been born once, we as our souls need to be born twice. And Lord, I pray each and every person here would be born again. Lord, our nation, our leaders need to be born again. They don't need another better argument or more science, or more uh, information, or more facts. They need to be born again. They need to repent. Republicans, Democrats, they need to repent. Lord, Congress people, business people, they need to repent. Lord, in this room, we need to repent. You said, if my people are called by my name, you would heal the land if we turn from our sins and our wicked ways. Lord, we ask that you would be merciful and gracious to us. We ask, Lord, that you would stay your hand of judgment. We deserve judgment, but you are so good and so kind. You've been gracious for a couple hundred years, Lord. We have many sins that down through the ages, Lord, things like slavery and racism and, and just hatred and, Lord, uh, the abortion that we talked about, all these things, Lord, we're guilty of them all. So we ask, Lord, that you would be uh, merciful in opening eyes and bringing people to the work of repentance and the saving knowledge of Jesus. We pray, Lord, uh, that you would open eyes that only you could open, Lord. And in your church, Lord, as you did in the book of Acts, 
when the Spirit fell, not only did souls get saved, but the apostles were filled with power. We in your church, Lord, we need to be filled with your power in these days. We need to see souls saved. We need to be li see lives filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. So we just humbly ask all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Your Bible's still open to John 1, I hope. Thanks for hanging in there as we covered a lot of ground this morning already, and we got more to cover. Is that okay if it's on? Is that okay if it's Okay, thanks. All right, John chapter 1. We did an overview last week. I love the book of John. John is one of these books that Almost every passage I read, I'm like, no, that's my favorite part of the book. So you'll hear me say that all through the book. And this is my new favorite part of John, because the whole 21 chapters is so rich, so powerful, so needed, and that we talked about why the Holy Spirit had John write this fourth and final gospel. It's the same gospel, but I mean of the synoptics. We talked about Matthew, Mark, and Luke being uh, more uh, similar to one another, and John's being rather unique. No parables, for example. It is all the eyewitness account of John, and many stories found in John that are not found in any other gospel. And we'll get to those with the, uh, the wedding feast in, uh, uh, in Cana, and the woman at the well, and uh, Nicodemus, and all these different situations that we see uh, that were unique and are unique to the book of John, the gospel of John. But we're going to pick it up and we read verses 1 through 18 last week just to kind of get a flavor of one of the most powerful texts in the Scriptures, but we're going to read just verses 1 through 5 this morning. So if your Bibles are open, if you don't have a Bible, raise your hand. We can put one in your hand, and the guys can even hand it to you pre-marked with John chapter 1 ready to go. Uh, but John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, just these first few powerful verses. Look with me. Those of you online, join us as well, starting with verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made. In Him was life. God is the God of life. Understand that. And the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Let's pray. Lord, we do want to comprehend your light. We do want to hear your word. We do want to walk in newness of life. Lord, we do want new beginnings here this morning. You're the God of new beginnings, new chances, new starts. We pray, Lord, that you would humble our hearts, soften our hearts, open our ears, open our eyes. Lord, we pray that you remove every distraction, everything that people are thinking about that would be a hindrance to hearing from the Holy Spirit. We pray that you would just remove the enemy. Lord, right now, disarm Satan that your people, and perhaps some that are soon to be your people, will hear from you. Lord, I pray that you'd remove me, as it were, from the equation that your word and your spirit alone would be heard. In Jesus' name I pray it. Amen. Amen. So Matthew's gospel, as we kind of um, look back at the other, for just a second, the other uh, gospels, Matthew's gospel begins with the genealogy of Jesus beginning at Abraham, and it goes immediately into the birth of Jesus. So that's Matthew's gospel. Mark's gospel, it begins at the ministry of John the Baptist and quickly turns to the ministry of Jesus. That's Mark's gospel. Luke's gospel begins with the birth of John the Baptist and then into the birth of Jesus. That's Luke's gospel. The opening of John's gospel combines some of Matthew and Mark's framework, but yet it's altogether different as it starts much further back than Abraham. Wouldn't you agree that in the beginning is way before Abraham? It starts with the very beginning, before transitioning to John and the incarnate ministry 
of Jesus. The starting point here is what? The creation of the universe. It's not starting with John the Baptist. It's not starting with Abraham. It's not starting with the genealogies. The starting point here is the creation of the universe and everything in it with Jesus at the center. Now, we live in a country where everyone, not everyone, but a ton of people now believe in evolution. They have way more faith than I do. That they can look at some of the things we're going to look at today and they think that they just created themselves. They evolved. All this stuff just kind of happened. Well, what, well where did that come from? You go farther back. So where did, where did something come from? Nothing. But we know that Jesus is at the center of all of this. Yet John, he doesn't use the name Jesus or Christ until verse 17. That's when we first see the name Jesus or Christ, where he uses both uh, together. Jesus Christ, the initial name for Jesus, uh, it's also a title. Christ is also a title. Uh, but the word is used here at the beginning three times in verse 1. The word, the word, the word. We see this name for Jesus as opposed to the name Jesus he starts with this name, which is also a title, the Word. And we talked about the fact that this is only used in the book of John and also in Revelation. But what a profound and powerful introduction that we will be looking at uh, this morning that just seamless, seamlessly connects Jesus to all that God is. And all that God says. And all that is contained in the Scripture, contained in what we also call, not only is Jesus the Word of God, but we call our Bibles the Word of God, right? Both of them are called the Word of God. And yet, it's not a connection, but rather it's a revelation to us. Uh, yes, Jesus is his name, and the Word of God is his name, and yes, they're connected, but even more than that, it's a revelation that Jesus is the living Word, the very Word of God. And it helps us make sense of his deity by revealing it this way. The Holy Spirit gave John these special instructions. Start your gospel in the beginning. Should I use the name Jesus? Not just yet. The Word, the Word, the Word. This is the Holy Spirit. Remember, John is not saying, here's what I think I'd like to put down. It's the Holy Spirit saying, this is what I want you to say, not only to the church, but all believers for all of time. Charles Spurgeon said, if you wish to know God, make sure I'm, if you wish to know God, you must know His Word. That's certainly true. It's precisely why we study the Scriptures and why we're studying the book of John. But a study of the Word always brings us to the person of the Word. Does that make sense? A study of the Word always brings you to the person of the Word, which is Jesus Himself, the Messiah, who is the living Word. Again, if you're taking notes this morning, it all began, it all began with the Word I'm not sure why this is not advancing. There we go. The, um, and we'll be looking at five things. We'll spend the majority of our time on the first three. I'll just spend really a couple of minutes on the last two because they're setting us up for the next text. But uh, let's jump right in to the first thing here this morning if you're taking notes. Uh, what I've titled the eternal word, these five things, this is the first. Um, the only other book of the Bible to begin with in the beginning is where? Genesis, the only other book of the Bible, begins in the beginning. We see that. If you guys can advance me, I might have to just walk you through it. I'm not sure why it's not advancing. but um, So we have the Holy Spirit via John immediately pointing us to a place where only Jesus resides. Only Jesus is still in the beginning and here and in the future. He's everywhere, Right? He's, it's a place where only Jesus resides, and we call that eternity. Eternity past, present, 
and future. Now everyone will live for eternity in either heaven or hell. Jesus specifically talks about that very, very much in the book of John. Not only in the book of John, but we'll get to where he talks specifically about uh, judgment and condemnation and hell versus heaven. But Jesus, uh, we will spend eternity somewhere, but Jesus is eternity. We'll spend, we'll live for eternity, but he is eternity. He has no beginning. We actually have a beginning. He has no beginning. When Jesus appears to John in Revelation, he's called the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and end. There's a connect, it's like a circle. The Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end, there's really no end. Now the use of the word beginning here, so you might say, well, then why is the word beginning used here? If Jesus doesn't have a beginning, why is the word beginning used here? Well, the word here is for us as a reference point because we all have to understand points in time. It's for us. As I mentioned last week, the other Gospels had already been written. It was established that Jesus had came, he had taught, he had lived, he had died, he had rose again from the grave. That was already established with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They, they were already written. That he ascended up into heaven where Jesus was sitting at the right hand of the Father at the time of John's writing, all of this was already known to the church. But he has to say, in the beginning, it's to say, before anything was, Jesus was. It's for our understanding, our finite understanding versus his infinite. Long before creation or the needed work of redemption, Jesus was already there, wherever there is, because it's outside of any dimension we can understand, or even me or anyone else can adequately articulate. Nobody can articulate that Jesus has no beginning, so we say, in the beginning. Like, before we, anything was, before anything existed, before anything came into being, Jesus was already there. And by invoking the exclusive title, The Word, alongside The Beginning, placed side by side, The Word, The Beginning, side by side, you have a, multi, uh, you have a multi-dimensional view of the Word of God. Is it Jesus? Yes. Is it the Scriptures? Yes. He is the yes and amen, isn't he? Is it the breath of God? Yes. Is it scriptures? Is it God? Is it Jesus? Is it the word of God? Yes, 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 and yes. An emphatic yes. In Psalm 119, hey, it worked. I didn't even pray. Thank you for whoever, whoever prayed that this would work. In Psalm 119, 89, forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. It's been there before we came into existence. The word was already there. Isaiah 40, verse 8, it says, The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God stands forever. People mock the Bible. People mock Jesus. It's been there forever. It'll be there forever. Everyone will come under it one day, right? Not only stands forever, but it is from forever. Are you building your life on the eternal word or mere words of men? You've got to ask yourself that question. What am I building my life on? Is it built on the eternal word? In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. And the word was God. He was in the beginning with, with God. Let's take a look at this. This is an interesting... He was with God, in the beginning with God, and yet he was God. Let's take a look at point number two if you're taking notes. What I've titled the triune word. The triune word. We know from what John states here that Jesus was before and outside of time. It's very clear that John is making the statement he's well before time. And yet he stepped into time and John actually walked with him for three years. Which we're going to get into the word made flesh is in the coming text. Now he says emphatically that Jesus was with God 
before everything. So he's clearly with God the Father before everything, and yet he says he's separate from God. It says he is with God, and yet he was God. How is this possible? With God, and yet he is God. So we see that he's distinctly different than the Father, and yet that's not what, where John stops. What he says next expresses what we call the Trinity when he says here he was with God and he was God. John is making the express statement of what we call doctrinally the Trinity. Right? He's saying this needs to be understood that God the Father and God the Son although he doesn't mention the Spirit here but he does elsewhere and we'll talk about that in just a second. But he's saying that this Jesus is the Son, he is the Word, and he's with the Father but he actually is also God himself. It's really hard for us to understand. Would you guys agree this is really hard to understand? Good, because if we could understand it all, we would be God, or at least equal or something. And we're not ever going to be there. We're always looking up to him. Jesus himself will make the same claim about him being God in John 14, 9. He says it himself. He says, he who has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus himself makes this statement. He receives the worship from Philip who says, my Lord and my what? God. But how can Jesus be with God and also be God? How, how, is that, how does that rectify itself? Jesus also prays, by the way, in John 17, he says, I was with you, Father, before the beginning. And, but he also says that they would be one even as we are one. So there's another statement from Jesus saying, I was with you, but yet we're one. This truth proclaims this divine nature of Jesus in this outside our comprehension, understanding of the Trinity. We accept the Trinity by what? Faith. Faith. Lord, we don't understand how this works. We don't understand how you have no beginning. We don't understand how we, everything has a beginning, right? iPhone has a beginning. The Model T had a beginning. Commodore computer had a beginning. Everything has a beginning, but not God, right? That's beyond our comprehension. Well, the Trinity is in that same light. It's outside of our comprehension, but it's clear in the scriptures. It's never mentioned by name. You'll never see the word Trinity by name in the Bible, but it's a very clear doctrine taught in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's, it's clear in both passages of scripture, uh, or both, uh, both covenants, in the New Covenant and the Old Covenant. On the one hand, God is one, solo. For example, You'll oftentimes hear people that don't believe in the Trinity quote this verse, and we love the verse as well. Deuteronomy 6, 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. If you were talking to a, a, a rabbi who's not a messianic follower of Christ, they would actually point to a scripture like this and say there's no such thing as the Trinity. God is one. But he's not just one. He's three in one in the persons of the Father and the Son. And here the Son is called the Word and the Holy Spirit. And as John begins this gospel uh, with the echo and parallel of Genesis 1-1, the revelation of Jesus being with God at the beginning, and more specifically that he is God, helps us interpret, believe it or not, this helps us interpret back to Genesis 1-1. It actually brings a little more light on Genesis chapter 1. I'm talking about the whole chapter of Genesis chapter 1. For it's in Genesis 1.26, we have this statement from God, and many of you have read this in your Bibles, and you, every time you read it you might either gloss over it or maybe it stands out to you, where it says in Genesis 1.26, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. See, we see the plurality of Elohim. That's the, the Hebrew word there for God. We see the, uh, the plurality of Elohim, speaking what we would call among the Godhead. And by the way, the word Godhead is not something I made up. That is also in the New Testament spoken of as the Godhead. The Godhead is, again, a understanding of the three-in-one plurality of God. 
The Spirit is mentioned in Genesis 1-2. The Spirit was hovering what? Over the deep, right? So the Spirit is mentioned in Genesis 1-2, where here it's mentioned, the Word is mentioned with God. So now Jesus, John says, I'm going to highlight Jesus, and then Moses, who wrote Genesis, I'm going to highlight the Spirit. But yet they all three were there. Of course, Jesus' prayer in John 17 further reveals that, because he talks about, they, I was there with you. In John chapter 1, the Spirit will be mentioned as well. John mentioned the Spirit in verse 32 as separate from Jesus and descending on Jesus. We'll get to that, right? When, it, when Jesus is baptized, what descends on Jesus? We have another distinct member of the Godhood. The Spirit descends on Jesus. So we continue to see the plurality of all three. And so all three members are actually mentioned by John in the opening chapter, although not all in the first five verses. The Spirit comes later in verse 32. But for any skeptics that are out there, those of you who may be watching online or maybe you're still a skeptic here, uh, that, that, that might say to me or other pastors or other theologians down through time uh, throughout the past 2,000 years that somehow we're misinterpreting this and there really isn't a trinity that you guys are just making this thing up John gets really specific and nails, puts the nail in the coffin, so to speak, of anyone that would actually be suspicious of the Trinity as a doctrine and the fact that God wants us to understand He is three in one, um, that that hero Israel, I am one in Deuteron Deuteronomy 6 4, is speaking of the Godhead and the plurality. John is laser specific in 1 John 5 7. Write this verse down. John wrote this epistle, same John that writes the book of John and the book of Revelation. John says in 1 John 5, 7, you can't get, did I have the verse already up there? Well, great, then you've had a chance to read it for a while now. So uh, he says that three bear witness in where? Heaven. The Father, he uses the same word, the Word, same, and the Holy Spirit. These three are? If that's the only verse we had, we'd be good enough, but we have many others and we don't have time to go through it this morning. But I hope that you understand that John was making clear this Jesus is one with God, one with the Spirit, and yet he's distinct in the Godhead. And how all that works together, you'll get to learn it a lot more when you get to heaven, provided you believe in Christ as your Lord and Savior and are. Let's look at the next thing if you're taking notes this morning. Not only was he in the beginning with God, not only was he with God, not only was God, but all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. Let's take a look at what I've titled the infinite word, if you're looking at point three here, the infinite word. So Jesus is the eternal word. He was with God the Father. He himself is also God. And as God, he has the power and the creative force found only in God. What type of power, what type of force does it take to create the known universe and everything in it? It takes infinite power. Infinite, really, there, has, there can't be any limit to this power. It goes on and on and on. I'm positive when we get to heaven, because God is infinite, we will continue to learn forever. We'll never stop learning. We'll never stop seeing new nuances of God's glory. We'll never stop understanding, oh, his, his riches are unsearchable. His love is, is, has no end. It would just go on and on and on and on. But it takes infinite power. It takes unlimited power. And an infinite God has the power to simply, by his word, simply speak everything into existence. Look at verse 3. All things were made through him. Without him, nothing was made. John's confronting evolution head on here, isn't he? <laughs> he knew that the spirit of Antichrist would come in our days, where people would really believe in that. And if you believe you evolved, you can believe you can do whatever you want. If you believe that there is no lawgiver, then there's no law for you. You can live any way you want. But if you believe that someone created you and you'll have to stand before that someone, you start to think a little differently, don't you? So it's better to just convince yourself that there is no God, therefore I can live like there's no God. 
I'm glad I know there's a God because we're all going to meet him one way or the other, right? And I'd rather meet him in a repentant, covered by the blood of Jesus, than say, why, I just, my science professor convinced me that you didn't exist, but turns out you do, right? One second after, first of all, God doesn't believe in atheists. Anyway, (laughs) Romans chapter 1, but uh, one second after death, nobody will be an atheist, so now is the time. Now is the time to believe that God is the creator of all things, including our ability to even think about it, to even conjure up a thought about it. But what things did he create? All things. And all things from nothing. Everything from nothing. He did it in six days, six 24 hour days. He could have done it in six seconds or six hundredths of a second. Why did he do it in six days? Well, he's creating our week. It wasn't just he was creating stuff, he was also creating time. And the seventh day rested the fact that we actually all need at least one rest day a week. He doesn't need a rest day. He never sleeps or slumbers, the Bible says. He didn't rest from tired. He set the example of this will be your week. And by the way, the atheist is stuck with a seven-day work week too. A seven, not work week, the atheist is stuck with seven days just... We're all, we're all given the same time frame because that's what God created. We do have seven 24-hour days, don't we? Exactly the way that God designed it. Now, you and I, we can't create one tiny, simple thing from nothing. Nothing. You can't create a paper clip from nothing, right? right? You can't create a grain of sand from air. But even if you had air, that's something. You get nothing if you want to match what God did. Nothing, not even the air. You've got to come up with air. Yet God created everything. The Word Himself, Jesus did it with infinite power. And I would say infinite creativity. Wouldn't you agree? From the macro being the mass of the universe, the macro, to the micro, the the atomic structure. Studying an atom, it's amazing. It's got its own little orbits and stuff. It's just amazing, but from the macro to the micro. But let's start for a second with the universe. We thought for centuries, our ancestors thought for centuries that there were thousands of stars. They would look up there, they would map them the best they could. The Greeks did, the Romans did, the Egyptians did. They mapped everything they could. They came up with the constellations and mapped them all out. There's the Big Dipper, there's Taurus, all these different things. And so, uh, But then later on we realized there were millions of stars. We thought, oh, we were a little off. We're, we were off by a couple factors. It's not just thousands, there's actually millions. And then uh, we found out that that was just a glimpse, and we discovered that there might be not only thousands or millions of stars, there might be thousands of galaxies. We were still off by a little bit. <laughs> then came the Hubble telescope. If you take a look at you guys can advance me if it doesn't advance, but um, came the Hubble telescope. That little that little tiny piece where there's an L, it's in yellow. That, what uh, the Hubble scale telescope did is they decided to focus on a black part of space where there was no visible stars. Even at the telescope level, the, these massive telescopes, that was black for them. Now, I'm not talking about your telescope that you put in the backyard. This is with NASA's telescopes, it was still jet black. And they said, is there anything there where it's jet black, or is that just a open space forever? And this is what they found. Click me the next one. Once they studied it for a week, and they kept the deep field view for a week solid, and it kept going and going and going, only on that one little black part of space, they just kept the camera, and it nonstop would go deeper and deeper and deeper. What they found, those are not stars, those are all galaxies. Millions of them. But none of that was visible to the naked eye. None of it was visible even to NASA's telescope. They just saw, all they saw was the blackness of space, but that was there. And I, I'm reading from what they saw was just a massive scale and a mass of color. And they're like, the colors are extraordinary. Like all the color spectrum is there, and it's all these amazing views. And indeed, it's God's handiwork, as the text, as the scripture says. On the screen, but I'm, I'm reading from an article that was in Forbes magazine, and this is what it said. It said, We collected data from hundreds 
of orbits across a multitude of different wavelengths hoping to reveal galaxies that were fainter and more distant and harder to see than any we had detected before. We hope to learn what the ultra-distant universe really looked like and when that first image was processed and released, we got a view like none other. And that's the view that they saw. Listen to the quote here. Everywhere we look, in all directions, there were galaxies. Not just a few, but thousands upon thousands of them. The universe, I love when scientists discover how big God is. Well, they, don't, they still don't see it yet necessarily, but he says... The universe wasn't empty. It wasn't dark. It was full of light-emitting sources. Very interesting observation and wording there, right? It's not dark. It's full of light-emitting sources. The latest estimates are now. We used to think there was thousands of stars, then millions of stars, then billions of stars, then thousands of galaxies. Now the latest estimate. The latest estimate is two trillion galaxies. But scientists admit we don't know what the real number is. There's probably more. And yes, I'm guessing there probably is more. Because <laughs> every time they find a dark spot and they can get a little deeper, they just, it just keeps going. The scriptures tell us, though, according to the book of Job, that all that we can see, if you guys can advance, there we go, is just a mere whisper of God's ways. By his spirit, he adorned the heavens. God came up... You and I, if, if there was no colors, you couldn't come up with a color. If there was no artistic anything, you couldn't come up with all this stuff. But God creates elephants, and he creates giraffes, and he creates galaxies, and he creates all the things that we see, and he adorns the heavens, and these, these are the mere edges of his ways. How small a whisper we hear of him, but the thunder of his power. Who can understand? God even wants you to hear him in the thunder, but see him in the heavens. Everything the cosmos whispers and overwhelms us with, if you really look up, that's why philosophers come to two things. They're like, man, either this Bible is true or we're totally, we're totally, completely discombobulated. What, how does this happen? Look up in the heavens, it should overwhelm us with, who can do this? Who can do this? He can, uh, according to Isaiah 48, 53, Indeed, my hand has laid the foundation of the earth, and my right hand has stretched out the heavens. God's hands are so big, he can just stretch out the heavens. He doesn't need to use his hands, he can use his voice. He can do either, right? It's like, just like as a parent. You can tell your kids to get there, or you can grab them there. <laughs> you can do either, right? So can God. He can speak universe into existence. He can stretch the universe. doesn't matter to him. He has equal power. With, uh, unlike us, we can't, I can't speak and my kids levitate to a place. But, uh, but they, you know, God can do with his voice or his hand. And what what the, all the scriptures writers are saying is he is unlimited in power. They're just trying to make the point that he doesn't have any limitations like us. He can use his voice. He can use his hands equally easy for God to speak time and space into being. Don't forget that that same voice would someday stretch out his arms on the cross and speak, Father, forgive them. That same voice that created the cosmos also will speak, why have you forsaken me? And instead of stretching the heavens, he'd stretch out his hand and nails in his hands. But back here on earth, we see the power of thunder and lightning of earthquakes and tornadoes and hurricanes, all that, that's just a mere edge of God's power. We're surrounded daily, click the next one, we're surrounded daily by the creativity and genius and power of God. Wouldn't you like to be there? <laughs> of course you would. You get your little tiny house right there on the, uh, on the island there. But uh, if God can create places like this, just imagine what heaven will be like because you just, I, this picture, me and my wife love, we love tropical landscapes and everything. Look at all the colors in just this one place. And God does all this. I mean, cobalt blue, we've got like four or five shades of blue. Uh, the sky is a different color. The white sands, the white clouds. And God says, this is just a mere whisper of what, if you think this is amazing, wait till you see what I've been doing in heaven. You've seen absolutely nothing. This will be like 
this would be like the dumpiest thing you could think of. <laughs> but we're surrounded by his creativity. We're surrounded by his genius and power. And yet so much of the world takes it for granted. I don't worship creation. I look at and I worship the creator. Amen. And I look at all that stuff and I see mountains and I see vistas and all that stuff. I think, what an amazing God. But just as we take his creation for granted, we also take his written word for granted, but all around us the proof of his handiwork is everywhere. Hit the next one. We have incredible uh, diversity. Seven million species in the biosphere. Seven million species. 10,000 bird species for you bird uh, watchers. You fish lovers, 40,000. And then each individual plant or animal, they're all uniquely complex, aren't they? So different from one another. Just take... And then, and then little components inside of each individual uh, creation. Take the human eye. We're not animals, by the way. If anyone tries to tell you, we're mammals. No, we're not. We're humans. Created separately in the image of God. That's why we're body, soul, and spirit. We have a three-in-one component that mirrors. We, don't have, we will live forever. But take the human eye here. It's incredibly complex. Made up of 40 subsystems including the retina, the pupil, the iris, the cornea, the lens, the optic nerve. Did you know the retina alone has 137 million cells? The retina alone, 137 million cells. 130 million are rods that handle black and white vision. I didn't even know I see in black and white, but you do. Uh, black and white vision, then 7 million cones handle color and correspond to interpret light. That's just the eye. Together, the eye, the optic nerve, and the visual cortex can interpret 1.5 million messages per millisecond. 1.5 million messages per millisecond. Your, your eye has been doing a lot of data crunching all this morning, whether you realize it or not. Not just trying to read my eye charts up there, but, uh, but your eye operates like a network of supercomputers. And this is just one tiny part of our entire anatomy. Just one... And, all the systems are working, the subsystems in our body, and that's just us. That's not including the thousands and thousands of other things that God has created. And to believe that they all evolved is absolutely ludicrous. In other words, uh, by the way, um, the, the theory that they evolved, if uh, this is one of these things that take the eye specifically, if all the subsystems of the eye aren't present and performing perfectly at the same exact instant, all 40 subsystems have to work at the same instant, at the same moment, the eye will not work or have no purpose whatsoever. It's called irreducible complexity. Irreducible complexity. They all have to work at the exact same moment. They can't evolve, in other words. If you have 40 components in the eye, 39 can't evolve and wait for the 40th. None of them work unless they all work at instantaneous. They have to be spoken into existence and work at the same. Does that make sense? They don't have, there's no chance for them to evolve. They have to be present immediately. You know? It'd be like you saying, well, I evolved. I didn't need oxygen for a long time. No, no. All of that has to be present at the same time. As the scriptures say, Next one, click through Psalm 139, 14. I will praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and my soul knows. Once you know God, your soul knows it. Not just your head knowledge. Your soul knows it. You can't convince. I, I, I love unsaved people, but they, they, they can tell me evolution till the day I die, and it has no impact. It really is like water off a duck's back with me. I'm, my soul knows God. My soul's been created. I know truth. Once you know truth, none of these things can, can, uh, can move you. Uh, and by the way, none of the things that we looked at even in, uh, include the complexity of the atomic level, that micro that I talked about. But uh, with our last couple of minutes, and literally the last couple of minutes, uh, move me forward to our point number four, and it's found here in verse four. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Just as the Word is the source of all creation, He's also the source of all life. God didn't just create inanimate objects. 
granite mountains, right? He didn't just create things that are beautiful to look at. He created living things. But us, he gave souls to live for eternity. And so uh, humanity, we quickly forget, and we see in this modern age, as people become more and more just engrossed with the inventions of modern man, they have, they're building their own Tower of Babel all over again of knowledge, which is no knowledge at all if you forget the source of it all. The life giver, right? What difference does it make to have a bunch of stuff if there's no life? God's the giver of life. In him was life. Jesus is the life. We'll, we'll, look, a lot at, we'll look at this theme a lot in the book of John. Everything humanity may forget, but there is no life without God. And it springs from the breath of God. God breathed life uh, into man. Uh, show me up on the screen, Genesis 2, 7. And the Lord formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into him the breath of life. And man became a living being. Not an evolved being, a living being. God gave us life. John is saying, look, John's not doing a whole exhaustive study of Genesis, but he's hearkening back to say, you need to know that Jesus is the source of it all. Jesus is with the Father. Jesus is the life. Jesus is the one that created all. He spoke it all in existence, and the fact that you are breathing right now is because he breathed life into you. One of Jesus' names is life. He's the way, the truth, and the life. It's one of his names. We're given life by him, and now we look to him for eternal life. We're given life. These babies we dedicated, they all have a birthday, but that's why I talked about we, we want them to have a second birthday, right? We want them to have eternal life. And we're talking about, even though eternity is for everybody, the lake of fire is eternal death. You don't want that. You want eternal life. And so we look to him not only for our life now, we pray for people who are sick. We pray that if they recover from COVID. I told you, my dad's 80, he's already had the virus. My stepmom's 74, she's already had the virus. We pray that they would, they would have health and life now. But ultimately, thankfully, my parents know Jesus. They have eternal life, right? That's the life that he breathes. And so our last thing, take a look at verse 5 and... You guys advance me forward, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. We'll look at this a lot throughout the book of John. Again, he's just kind of pointing out these things to start in his prologue, if you will. But just as the galaxies pierced the darkness of the universe, and the scientists thought that all that black, whoo, there was actually light. Because God pierces the darkness, doesn't he? And Jesus is the light of the world that pierced the darkness. And the reason why we're spending such little on this is we're going to look at a lot of this in the next couple of verses where it talks about Jesus being the light uh, starting in verse 6 and 7. And we'll get to that in our next study. But just as the galaxies pierce, again, we see all that darkness and the stars light it up. But Jesus is the light that lights everything up. Put up Acts 26, 18 there for us. Um, when Jesus called Paul, he said, you will be used by me to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light. From the power of Satan, who loves darkness and loves people to be in darkness, that they may receive the forgiveness of sins and inheritance who is, of those who are sanctified by me in faith. And so the whole story is Jesus saying, I'm going to give light to the world that I was there before the world and brought the original light into the world and now that it's gone dark because of sin I have to come and be the light that draws them back to that relationship with the Father and we're going to look at more and more of this as we go through the book that John is saying all of this is connected but you must accept Jesus for all that he is he's not just a prophet he's not just a good man he's God himself you can't say well I, I believe in God but I don't believe in Jesus I've met people that tell me that that's not possible because you're rejecting God if you reject Jesus. He is equal to the Father and actually is the Father. Last verse, John 8, 12, and we'll certainly get to this in uh, chapter 8 as well. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. 
But brothers and sisters, as we come to a close, we need all that Jesus is, don't we? We need his creative power. We need his authority. We need his infinite power. We need all that Jesus is. And he'll give us all of himself to us if we give ourselves to him. Amen? Amen. Let's close in prayer. Father, we just uh, come before you again. We're just grateful, Lord, that you do not hide your truth, but like a light in darkness, you, you show a light in the darkness. Lord, if you did not shine the light, I'd still be lost. My brothers and sisters here, those online would still be lost. And Lord, I just want to give the opportunity, Jesus, if there's anyone here that's still in darkness, that you would call them to your marvelous light. And before we close in worship, I just want to, if there's anyone here at all, or maybe you're online and you're here this morning and you say, yeah, I just at the last minute decided to come or, or log in or watch online and I and I got kind of sucked in, and after a while I decided I'd listen to the whole thing, and maybe God is speaking to you. And uh, you know, when I came to Christ, me and my wife, we were out till dark, 3 in the morning at a bar the night before, and God brought us to church on a Sunday morning, and we got saved. We, we found that second birth where we gave our hearts and lives to Jesus. And if there's anyone here this morning who say, man, I, I really was believing that I just evolved and all this stuff, but the Holy Spirit has convinced me that no, God created me and there's a, it's a point on demand once to live and once to die. But we'd be ready for death with the life of Jesus. If there's anyone here, just stand right where you're at. I want to pray with you. Yeah, don't worry about what anyone thinks. Just stand right where you're at. If you're at home, stand up in your living room. If you're driving, pull over before you stand up. Anyone at all? I don't want to assume that you all know the Lord, but I've been teaching as brothers and sisters, but if there's anyone here that's not yet, God wants to speak to you. I'm just going to pray a prayer. Maybe there's someone online and you guys can just keep your heads bowed for just a moment. Lord, if there's anyone, I pray that they are praying with their heart. The Bible says, Lord, if we believe with our heart and confess with our mouth that you've been raised from the dead, we will be saved, Lord. But it's a, we know that it's a true asking for forgiveness. It's a true sorrow for sin, but also a crying out for your mercy and grace. And Lord, you're willing to give it. And Lord, I'm just going to pray. If there's anyone, I pray, Lord, that they're, even at the last moment, if they want to stand or they're at home, that, uh, Lord, that they would not put it off another day. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. But Lord, that we would understand that today is the day of salvation. So if there's anyone, just pray with me. Lord Jesus, thank you that you who created the world stepped into time, put on human flesh to come and take my sins on the cross and stretch out those hands that stretch out the heavens and cry out, forgive them. And shed your blood, Lord, and take the torture of the cross for my sins. Lord, forgive me. Wash me. Cleanse me, for I'm deciding this day to follow you, Jesus. Lord, Write my name in the land's book of life. Lord, I want to now serve you. Give me your Holy Spirit to help me to serve you and to grow in your grace and to grow in your word. And I ask all of these things humbly in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hey, why don't you stand as we close in worship?
fate I dread. No fate I dread. I know I am forgiven. The future sure. The price it has been paid. For Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon. And he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hold, my sin has been defeated. Jesus now and ever is my plea. All the chains are released, I can sing, I am free. Thank you for hanging in there with me battling the clicker the whole time through, and you guys did great. God doesn't create imperfect things like this, uh, but we have a God that has created us in his image, but ultimately to serve him. And I pray that this coming week, you, as you look at the things around you, don't take them for granted. Say, God created that. Yes. You know, the Bible, you know, even when I love there's a psalm that talks about, you know, uh, there's numerous psalms, but, uh, but some that I'll listen to where the, the psalmist will just look at creation and it'll just spawn worship in us, and it should. And so we should be able to look at other people this week, and, and even if they are as lost as lost could be and they hate Christians and they hate God, they were still creating the image of God, and you can give them grace and say, Lord, I pray that they would, their eyes would be open, that they're currently in darkness, that, that you would, that little L black area in space might be their heart right now, but you would come in and all of a sudden bring in that light and that, that they would find uh, that they have a reason to live and it's not for themselves. It's to turn and give ourselves to the Lord. So I'm looking forward to continuing this study in John. Uh, next Sunday, by the way, I won't be here. I'll be down uh, sharing at Calvary Chapel um, Williamsburg. Yeah, that's where I'll be. I'll be down at Calvary Chapel Williamsburg and uh, I have Zach sharing next week. Zach, raise your hand. He's back from India for a while. Most of you guys know Zach. He'll be sharing. And uh, praise God, he has a word that he's going to be sharing next Sunday. And I'll be back the Sunday after that. But uh, uh, I can't, I took, as you guys know, I took um, three weeks out. And for me to do it, when other pastors, I had, they helped me, I have to help them. When they also... <laughs> Tom's going to be in California for three weeks, so me and two other pastors are all taking a week. And so uh, thank you for uh, supporting us, that we can support one another in the body of Christ. So I'll be down there next Sunday. Zach will be sharing, and then we'll jump back into the next part of John the week after. But uh, this coming Wednesday, again, we'll have the prayer drive through if you want to come out. Uh, say hi to Larry and Ann on the way out. Say hi to the babies. Let's close in prayer. And uh, pray the Lord gives you a week that is used of him. Lord, we just thank you again for this time. May your word not just be things that we learn, but that we walk in it. Lord, you don't want us to know truth, but to apply truth. 
and to walk in truth. And Lord, you're not looking for us to have information, but transformation. And so Lord, we pray that you would just fill us with your spirit as we leave here and by Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. Give us divine appointments with people that don't know you. Maybe they believe they evolved and maybe through our witness they realize that no, they were created by a God who loves them and sent his only begotten son. So Lord, use us in these dark times in which we live and may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You have a great Sunday.